Patty says, down the Via Della Rosa in the words. Is that, am I remembering that right? But it's uphill all the way. <laughs> I was panting up that hill, said, Sandy, we need to change the words a little bit. Uh, but you know, going up the Via Della Rosa, it just reminds you, uh, Jesus has been severely whipped by then, and they put a hundred pound cross beam across his shoulders and probably strapped it to him with ropes and whipped him along the way, totally physically uh, spent. Uh, they compelled Simon of Cyrene to help him carry the weight of that cross beam till they came, as the scriptures say, to the place of the skull, and there they crucified him between two criminals. And so it was that the word who had become flesh and dwelt among us also died in our midst, and he was the one person in all the world. He was the one person of all the thousands and thousands that the Romans crucified. He was the one person, the only person, that didn't deserve to be on a cross. And so before his death, he had a Passover meal uh, with his disciples. I don't know if you're aware of it, but when the Jewish people observe a Passover meal today, they always leave one empty chair at the table with a place setting, and they base that on the scripture that before the great day of the Lord comes, Elijah will come. And so every year at Passover, they anticipate, they hope, and they set a place for Elijah to come. An empty seat, a full table setting, Maybe Elijah will come to Passover this year. Um, for those of us who believe in the Lord Jesus Christ, Jesus put it this way. He said, Elijah has come, if you'll hear it. And of course, he was talking about the ministry of John the Baptist. I'm going to ask Brother Charles and Tim to come and prepare the table for our service. I think I've told some of you the story that in the church I grew up in as a little boy, we had it in our church bylaws that we had to do the Lord's Supper the first Sunday of every quarter. And just like clockwork and in legal obedience to the bylaws, the first Sunday of every quarter you'd go in and you'd see the Lord's Supper table prepared before the congregation. We would have what I would call a normal service with singing and prayer and offering and sermon, invitation. And then after the invitation, we would go into the Lord's Supper. The deacons would come forward. We would pass out the bread and take it. Then we'd pass out the cup. And in our small church of about 150 people, it took all of about 10 minutes to do the Lord's Supper, and then we sang, Bless be the tie that binds, as they sang a hymn and went out, and that's what we did. We sang, Bless be the tie that binds, and we left the church. But you know, even though I wasn't saved yet, and even though I was just eight, nine, ten years old, even I said to myself, Surely there is more to it. Uh, than that. Now I appreciate every church I've been in, uh, pastor of or interim of or supply, every church I've been a part of has had it in their bylaws to do the Lord's Supper on a regular basis. And I appreciate that because churches need to be reminded somehow. This is what the Lord has commanded us to do. In fact, what a great privilege for me to baptize and then do the Lord's Supper on the same day because these are the two ordinances that Christ has left us. 
And both of them signify the same thing in different ways. Baptism, the burial and resurrection, and here we commemorate, as Ken was saying earlier through the songs that have been selected, that old rugged cross that Jesus went to, the blood that he shed on our behalf, uh, the bread representing his body and the cup representing his blood. How significant is that? And how awesome is it that God commended his love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. If you have your copy of God's Word, I want you to open with me to Luke chapter 22. Luke chapter 22, and I want to begin reading in verse 14. Luke 22, beginning in verse 14. When the hour had come, he reclined at the table and the apostles with him. And he said to them, I have earnestly desired to eat this Passover with you before I suffer. For I say unto you, I shall never again eat it until it is fulfilled in the kingdom of God. And when he had taken a cup and given thanks, he said, Take this and share it among yourselves. For I say to you, I will not drink of the fruit of the vine from now on until the kingdom of God comes. And when he had taken some bread and given thanks, he broke it and gave it to them, saying, This is my body, which is given for you. Do this in remembrance of me. And in the same way, he took the cup after they had eaten, saying, This cup, which is poured out for you, is the new covenant in my blood. But behold, the hand of the one betraying me is with mine on the table. For indeed, the Son of Man is going as it has been determined. But woe to that man by whom he is betrayed. And they began to discuss among themselves which one of them it might be who was going to do this thing. And there arose also a dispute among them as to which one of them was regarded to be greatest. You know, when they did a Passover meal, they would usually arrange the tables in a horseshoe or U-shape. And the greatest person, which I would presume to be Jesus, would be at the head table right in the middle. And then the second most important person to his right and the next most important to his left and then going out from there. I don't know about that night, if they took time to put everybody in a particular place, but I have a feeling they didn't. I have a feeling everyone just pulled up, they lay on their left side with their heads near the table and their feet uh, away from the table, and they would lay slanted around these very low tables, and that's how they would eat and drink. And when they got to this discussion about who is the greatest, it might have been because they weren't in the normal order. Maybe Peter was down there around the foot of the table and he was thinking, I should be up there at Jesus' right hand. And maybe someone else, like Andrew, his brother, said, wait a minute, I was one of the first ones to come to Jesus. I should certainly be uh, one side or the other. Or maybe John, the disciple whom Jesus loved, and you know from other texts, and even from great paintings like Leonardo da Vinci's The Last Supper in Milan, Italy, you know that John is depicted as the disciple who's leaning on Jesus' breast at the supper. But for whatever reason, two things came into the discussion of that last meal. One was, someone's going to betray me. And Jesus was talking about one from the twelve his inner circle. It's reflective almost of the 12 sons of Jacob. And you remember what they did to Joseph? The uh, older brothers of Joseph put him in a pit and they couldn't decide what to do with him. Some of the brothers were so jealous of him they wanted to kill him. But Judah spoke up and said, no, we don't want to do that. And Reuben spoke up. And so there was a caravan of slave traders passing by on their way to Egypt. 
And they sold their brother into slavery for 20 pieces of silver. And so it would be very many millennia later, like 18 millennia later, here's Jesus with the 12. The 12 that he had spent the most time with. The 12 that he had poured his life and soul into. And one of those, Judas, would betray him. In the Gospel of John, chapter 13, it says, After the supper, Jesus got up, he took off his coat, he wrapped a towel around his waist, he got down on his knees, and he washed the filth off the feet of his disciples. And when he was finished, he got back up, he put the coat on, and he looked at his disciples and he asked them a question. He said, Do you understand what I have done for you? You call me teacher, you call me master, all those things are true. But if I'm your teacher and your master, if I have served you by washing your feet, how much more ought you to serve one another? And yet, besides betrayal that night, the second theme that came up is, who is the greatest? Isn't that something? Jesus had to deal with betrayal and triviality. All from his inner group. And right in front of him was his own suffering and death. And you heard me read a moment ago. Jesus said, with great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. In the Greek text, it uses a lot of verbs put together to get that construction, great desire. It doesn't want you to read it casually and just say, I was looking forward to this supper. No. He says, with great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. Even the word this in Greek, it's a demonstrative pronoun. And you know what demonstrators do? You saw them on the news yesterday didn't you all over the country demonstrators demonstrators want to call attention to a cause and that's what demonstrative pronouns do in the greek text they want to call attention jesus said with great desire i have desired to eat this passover with you because he had eaten several passovers with his disciples probably three before he came to this one but what made this one so special, and the reason we call it the Last Supper, is because this was the last time Jesus would have the Passover meal with them. And so the Bible says that he took bread and he told them, this is my body, which is given for you. And in doing that, he changed, enhanced, improved, empowered Passover to mean something more than it ever had. Before, the little piece of bread was unleavened bread, and it reminded them of Exodus 12, where the Lord said, I'm about to bring you out of bondage. You won't have time to cook your bread properly, adding yeast, waiting for the dough to rise, and all of that. He said, just take the dough without yeast and cook it. I want you to eat the bread without leaven. I want you to have your loins girded. That means be dressed and ready to go. Have staff in hand because I'm going to pass through the land. And when I see the blood of your Passover lamb, I'm going to pass over you. So the bread, the unleavened bread, was basically for Passover a reminder that our forefathers ate in haste because God was about to do something great and we had to be ready to roll on a second's notice. But Jesus took that unleavened bread and he broke it and he passed it around to his disciples and even though they were focused on betrayal and triviality, who's the greatest? Jesus said, from now on, this bread represents my body given for you. I'm going to ask the deacons to come now to distribute the bread.
Brother Charles, would you say thanks for the bread for us, please? Heavenly Father, we do thank you that you had your body broken and your life was healed. Thank you for the sacrifice you made. Forgive us where we fail. In Christ's name we do that. Amen. This is my body given for you.
after the bread, the Bible says Jesus took the cup. You might have noticed when we're reading Luke 22 that Jesus took a cup, then the bread, then another cup. And he was doing a Passover meal with his disciples. And the Passover meal actually has four cups. And with each cup, they have a remembrance of what God said he would do. For the first cup, God had promised, I will take you out of Egypt. And they would drink of a cup. As a more contemporary Jew said, we were toasting God for taking us out of Egypt. The second promise of God is, I will save you from bondage. And then they would take the second cup. It's believed that the first cup we read about in Luke 14 was either the first or second cup. We don't know. But the third cup was taken immediately after the meal. In other words, after they had eaten the unleavened bread. And so it is believed that the cup that Jesus took right after the bread, which we're about to take now, was with this promise, number three, I will redeem you. And that's what the gospel is all about. And that's why Jesus said with great desire, I have desired to eat this Passover with you. And remember those next words? Before I suffer. It was through the way of suffering and death, Jesus' death. What the one that Paul wrote about, he was a man who knew no sin. He never sinned. Yet God made him a sin offering for us that we could be made the righteousness of God in him. I can see Jesus promising those disciples at that Passover meal, I will redeem you. And then when they were done, they had one last cup, and they would sing and go out. And that last cup is, I will take you as a nation. And you can't read that and know your Bibles and not think all the way back to God's call on Abram. God called Abram to let go of everything the men of Babel clung to. We'll build a city for ourselves, they said. We'll build a tower whose top reaches into heaven. We'll make a name for ourselves, they said. Sin. And God judged them. But he came to Abram and he said, let go of everything the men of Babel tried to cling to. Leave your country, your kindred, your father's house, and go to a land that I will show you. I'll be with you. I will make of you a great nation. I will bless those who bless you and curse those who curse you. I will make your name great. And by you, all the families of the earth will be blessed. When we finish the Tower of Babel story in Genesis eleven nine, 9, mankind is lost and scattered on the face of the earth. And we're left to ask, how will God bring His grace to lost, scattered humanity? And in chapter 12, we get our answer. He'll get it through an obedient person. And Genesis 12, 4a becomes one of my favorite half verses in the Bible when the Lord called Abram, promised him everything I just quoted to you. It says, so Abram went just as the Lord had spoken to him. When Jesus said, I will, in that Passover meal, I will take you as a nation, He was fulfilling a promise of God that started with Abraham, that continued with Moses when he said, I will make of you, take of you as a special possession of mine for all the earth is mine and I'll make you a kingdom of priests and a holy nation. And here we are, 2018, around the table that was inspired by the Passover and transformed by our Lord Jesus Christ. The prophet Isaiah was blessed to preach the words of the Lord when he said, I will make a new covenant with my people. Not like the old covenant etched in stone, the one that they broke over and over again. 
The new covenant I'll etch on the tablets of their hearts. And no longer will there be a need for each person to say, Know the Lord, for all my people will know me. And Jesus, on the very night that he was betrayed, he took the cup and he said, This cup, this cup that goes with the promise, I will redeem you, this cup is the new covenant in my blood. And so what Jeremiah preached almost 700 years earlier, Jesus said, tonight and tomorrow it is fulfilled. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. I'm going to ask the deacons to come and distribute the cup. I give you peace I leave my forgiveness take and eat this is my body given for you take in remembrance of me this is our freedom, this is our life, His body broken, His sacrifice. This is our freedom, this was the cost, the blood He shed. I give you grace so free my forgiveness take and drink this is my blood poured out for you take in remembrance of this is our freedom, this is our life, His body broken, His sacrifice. This is our freedom, this was the cost, the blood He shed. Love I give you, love I leave, go and share it, go in peace. You are my body, my hands and feet, live in remembrance of me. This is our freedom, this is our life, His body broken, His sacrifice. This is our freedom, this was the 
the cost, the blood he shed on the cross. This is our freedom, this is our life, his body broken, his sacrifice, this is our freedom. This was his cost, the blood he shed on the cross, the blood he shed on the cross, the blood he shed on the cross, on the cross, on the cover the cups with a cross, it reminds us that this little cup of juice that we partake of represents the precious blood of Jesus Christ that he poured out for us on a cruel Roman cross 2,000 years ago. Brother Tim, would you bless the cup for us, please? Jesus said, take and drink. This cup is the new covenant in my blood. Thank you. At this time, we come to what my pastors always called the most important part of the service. I have to confess over the years I've been guilty 
of getting in that little bit of antsy mode. I need to get out of church. And I actually looked at the bulletin and saw the invitation. Said, okay, when we get there, we only have a minute or so, we're done. But I asked God to forgive me of that mindset. Because I just thought, what if Christ came again? And the only reason someone didn't make a profession of faith is because when the pastor was given the invitation, I was in such a hurry to get to a restaurant or on with my afternoon schedule that when the invitation was given, here I am a believer, and I rushed out the back door. For what? What could possibly be more important? I told you I got the privilege of being a counselor for Billy Graham for four crusades. They taught us how important it was to take the invitation seriously as God's people. Because if we're in a hurry to get away, then what about the person that the Holy Spirit is working on? And Satan's working on them not to come and the Holy Spirit is convicting them to come. And then the Christians walk out. We want to give this invitation for every one of you today. Some of you may want to come and kneel at this altar and pray. Kneel by the Lord's Supper table just to thank the Lord for what He did. If you're here and you've never made a public profession of faith, you don't have to do that in church. You don't even have to walk this aisle to be saved. I was saved on a Sunday afternoon in a friend's home. But this is a good place to do it because you're among friends. And as you saw when we baptized, this is a group project. God pulls us together. No Lone Ranger Christians in the church. God pulls us together as family. We'd love to hug your neck and welcome you to the fellowship of the body of Christ. Amen? Amen. And then, brothers and sisters, those of you who, like me, are saved, if God's dealing with you, I'm here if you would like to pray with a pastor or you want to pray at the altar or just come and rededicate your life this is for you brother ken would you lead us as we sing would you stand